Tonight, uh, I just feel like God wants us to, to take some of the things that have been shared here uh, from the pulpit these last several weeks and uh, put, put it somewhat into action and, uh, and be sure that we are where God wants us to be right now in this day and this hour. Amen? Uh, we all know that we're living in some troubling times. Troubling in the fact that I'm, I'm just troubled by the times, aren't you? <laughs> I'm troubled all the time by the, the times. And I, uh, it, it, whenever I take a sneak peek at the news and stuff, I, I just like, yeah, why did I do that? Um, I know you want to be informed, but, uh, but I hate being depressed. So it's kind of one of those double-edged swords. And uh, I, I got to keep reminding myself what the report of heaven is. And it's getting worse and worse in this earth for the people of the earth, the condition of the earth, for society in general. We've lost our path, our compass, our north star, which is Christ. The worse that it gets, it seems to be getting better and better for the king's return. Amen? Amen. It's posturing for the king's return. Uh, it was exactly a year ago this past week um, that our world got turned upside down for most of us in a way it never had before. It was March 18th of last year that we were ho- I was sitting right here and Facebook living our first Wednesday night service. And then Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday. So for six weeks we had, none of y'all were here, right? Everybody stayed home, no one's supposed to leave your house, not leave your property, and everybody was all extremely scared about what was going on. Here we are a year later, we, got, we know a whole lot more things. Uh, I'm not gonna get into all that, uh, but we just know that we're here, and we're here in person, and there are still churches that have not yet met in person. We took six weeks off meeting in person, and we felt like God told us to meet back in person, and I know that we were one of the ones that did that first. Um, but that has been now over a year ago, and it seems like years ago, doesn't it? And I remember we started coming here for prayer every morning about a year ago, and in the evenings we were doing that, um, and setting a watch in the mornings and evenings for those that would come out or could come out. And then I remember that because I remember, I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna sneak by Walmart on the way home and see if there's any toilet paper. <laughs> That's how I remember that. That was a year ago. That was a year ago. Was, we had toilet paper. I was like, I'm just going to keep on making sure that we have enough, all right? Uh, don't want to be without. So I want to talk tonight about the anointing and um, the fact that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is such an essential part of our lives and what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit more. Um, I know that my father was uh, sharing on this and Pastor Bruce was sharing on this as well in the last several weeks. And I'm just going to kind of pick up uh, where they left off a little bit and just expound a little bit more on that. And also, I believe that God wants to do some stuff here tonight. Um, because I feel as though, um, at, not just me, but I know that we've talked as elders. And, um, you know, there's, there's sometimes it kind of comes and goes in waves. There's a lot of laying on of hands, a lot of ministry time. It seemed like for a while there we had every, every Sunday morning there was ministry up front. And then it, it's kind of um, not been as often and stuff. But, um, but I feel like God wants to do some stuff here tonight. And leave opportunity for the Holy Spirit to move and to fill you up. Sound good? Recapping some of the stuff that's been shared lately. Um, buying the oil, the anointing of God. It, it's, it's a costly thing. The anointing is not something that's cheap or comes cheaply. It, there's a cost to it. And it, it, if you're going to pursue after God, it's going to cost you your life. And I'm not talking once and for all. You, you, you bite the bullet and, 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 and you face a martyr's death. That may be. It's going to cost you your life and your will. And I, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be the kind of person who evangelizes and is a snake oil salesman. I don't want to, I don't want to do a bait and switch on you. So when I lead people to the Lord, I, I, I stay far from that. I don't, I don't get excited about getting them to the point where we say the sinner's prayer. It's about them accepting the fact that they need to surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so I make no bones about it. It has to be about surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You don't just need him to be your savior. He is that. But again, your Bible calls him Lord far more often than it calls him savior. And there's a reason for that because we need his lordship too. We need him to be Lord of our lives to the point where we say, not my will, but yours be done in every single circumstance and situation until we only do and always do as the father says. Only do and always do what the father says. That's the kind of life he is expecting us to live through him. It's impossible to do this on your own. 
You cannot do this, I'm convinced. You cannot do this without the anointing being in your life. And it's so hard to do this without the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit indwelling within you. It becomes religious, it becomes a goal you try to attain on your own, and that is not what we're called to. He will do in us and through us what we cannot do ourselves. You have to understand that. You cannot get the job done. You're not that good. And you're in a sinful state. You entered into this world in a sinful state. So one had to come as the sinless, spotless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world who had to come and fulfill for us what we could not do ourselves. That's total surrender and dependency of dependence upon another person. We talked about how the disciples, they were weak. I remember my father shared about how they could not watch one hour with Jesus in his time of need. Imagine your best friend in the world. Might be your spouse. Can you pray with me? I mean, I'm at death's door. Can you pray with me? Joel, I'm, I'm, I'm at death's door. I could, in the next hour, it's going to determine whether I live or die. Yes, honey, I'll pray with you. And then she's snoring in 10 minutes. It's cold. It's cold. Not, not feeling the love, are you? Can you imagine that? That's how weak they were. It was his dark hour. He knew it was that time. And he just needed, he didn't ask all the disciples to come with him. He just took the three in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and they were snoring and sleeping. Then he comes back, and guys, come on, I really need you. Be my buddy. <laughs> you got my back, right? We got your back. Go, go pray, Jesus. And they come, they're sleeping again and again. Could you not watch one hour with me? Watching and praying. It's still the command that we are still given today, to be soberly minded, to be watchful. We have to be watching and praying and watching and praying. This is still the command that God has upon us. But I want to ask the question, are we, snooze, are we snoozing? Are we snoring? Are we sleeping? I, I believe that most of the church is. Let's not be those who are fast asleep, especially in an hour when we ought to know better. He was giving them all sorts of hints and sometimes telling them straight out what he was saying. And they still weren't getting it, right? We're living in perilous times, troubling times. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. Here we are, like I said, a year into this whole pandemic plus, and life's changed in a lot of ways. It really has. There's a lot of things that are not back to normal, nor will they ever get back to normal. But that's okay, because normal is heaven. So maybe our definition of normal has been wrong the whole time. And maybe we need to just redefine what normal looks like. Man, at this point, I was supposed to read something out of my journal, but I left my journal in my truck in my garage. Darn it. I'll have to come back to that oh, maybe on Sunday. All right. Then we look at the, the story re revisiting again in Matthew 25. Turn there real quick. Um, and I know it seems like we keep camping out on this story, but there's so much revelation in this story of the, of the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. The, the, the wise ones, the five that were wise and the five that were foolish, we know what the difference was. What marked the difference between the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. What was it? Oil. Did they all have lamps? Yes or no? Yes. I believe they all had oil in their lamps. How foolish is it to have a flashlight with no batteries in it? Problem is, most of the flashlights we have in our house now these days probably do have batteries in them. It's just the batteries are dead. I've got probably a, several in our house in case of emergency, and then when the lights go out, we're banging on it, and it's like, ah, the bat I know I put new batteries in there three years ago, all right, and, and it's not coming on. We've got something in there, but it doesn't last long, right? And of course, most of us have phones anyway, so we don't even use flashlights anymore. <laughs> Point I'm trying to make then is, is that like that, I believe they had oil in their lamps, but they didn't have the oil to sustain them through the time that was coming through the darkness of the night, through all the troubles they were facing. And I want to look specifically at a couple of the verses here. Verse 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, it wasn't that, it's not that Jesus is, it's not that he's late, he's never early, never late, delayed in our eyes, right? Uh, we're still waiting, we're waiting, we're anticipating, but while that happened, they all slumbered and slept. When at a time we are to be watchful, right? At a time that we should be looking, they all slumbered and they all slept. Again, uh, 
verse uh, 6, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. It says all of them did that. But the foolish said, Give us some of your oil for ours are going out, or some versions say, have gone out. When you look up that phrase, have gone out or going out, it literally means to extinguish, I want you to think about this in terms of the Holy Spirit, to extinguish, to quench. What does the Bible say about quenching the Holy Spirit? Yeah, don't. Okay, good. And even worse, not to do what? To grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not quench, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What gets us to the point where we're quenching and what gets us to the point where we're going beyond even quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit? These are questions that, ah, these things always go bouncing around in my head, right? I'm always wondering these things. God, at what point are we quenching the Spirit? Is it when we've just, maybe we've taken the Spirit for granted? Maybe we've not taken it seriously enough. Maybe we've not activated the gifts of the Spirit. Maybe we've not activated the gift of tongues in our lives where we're supposed to pray in the Spirit, right? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Strengthening ourselves in our most holy faith as we pray in the Holy Ghost. We're commanded to do that. Well, why wouldn't we? It's something we ought to be doing often. Then to the point where we actually grieve the Holy Spirit. What grieves him? There's so many things in Scripture that talk about these kind of things. What, you know, Obviously, where God can be grieved, but... We, we can grieve the Holy Spirit so often, so much in what we do, what we say, and how we act. And the fact that we, listen, I, one thing that grieves him is our absence from his presence. And how about this? We, we have the Holy Spirit, but we don't activate or use the Holy Spirit. We don't speak to God. We go days without end without speaking to God. This is what most normal church living is today. Sunday morning, everybody speaks to God. They might do it in a midweek service. What about Monday, Tuesday? What about every day of the week? People who are Christians who converse with God for an hour on a Sunday morning, what about every other day of the week? Do you think maybe it grieves the relationship we have with God when we ignore him for the majority of our week? I'm not saying everybody here does that. But I would say overall the church around the world does a lot of that. And I think it grieves him because he really loves us deeply and he wants us to share in a loving relationship with him. Their lamps are gone out. They're extinguished. And if we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us, the Bible says the same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it dwells in us, it will quicken these mortal bodies by that same spirit that dwells in us. That spirit can quicken mortality. It can make us able to do things that we could not do otherwise. Does that spirit live within you? Because I know it lives within me, but, but if I ignore his presence, or if I choose to cover up my Christian faith in any way, or I extinguish the gifts of the spirit, I quench the moving of the spirit, or the other words are suppress or stifle, the Spirit. Their lamps were going out. They did not have the anointing to carry them through. They didn't have the extra oil. Let me tell you something about the oil. It's a costly process. You don't, I know you can go purchase oil and that's what we would do, but someone has to make that oil, right? And it always comes through a crushing and pressing process. I want you to think about that a minute. Something or someone has to go through a crushing or pressing process. I believe that God is pressing us right now. I mean, it was hard enough, life was hard enough a year and a week ago. It was hard enough, right? Needed the Holy Spirit, needed the anointing, it was hard enough to get through life. Life was tough enough. And then this past year, then all the things that we've been challenged with and all the, the craziness of this year, the, it, it's just, it's, listen, it's been a hard year. It's been tough, right? And it's probably going to keep happening. It's probably going to keep getting worse. I don't, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer or anything here, but just understand that when you read the rest of the book, stuff's going to happen. The anointing can carry you through anything. The, the power of the Holy Spirit can carry you through any tough time. As long as we don't quench it, extinguish it, suppress or stifle the power of the Spirit. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5.
In Ephesians 5, I'm going to start reading in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise people, right? God wants us to be wise, not foolish. So walk like that, all right? Be those who walk with wisdom and not as fools. Now, you want to see the difference between the two? Just read the book of Proverbs, <laughs> okay? You read the book of Proverbs, it tells you what the fool does and what the wise man does, right? In, in like every aspect of life. Goes on and says in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That was a theme that we kept getting over and over again through times of prayer and intercession and prophetic utterances and words throughout this past year. It is time for us to redeem the time, to, to buy back the time, right? So it's like this past year, it feels like a lot of things were robbed from people and you, it's like everyone wants like to buy it back. Let's get that year back, right? And yet, that's, that's, that's what it means to redeem the time to, and to make good use of that time. How much time have you wasted in your life? Yeah, everybody, everybody just choked. All right, good. I'm, I'm amongst friends here. How much wasted time have you had in your life, if you think about it? And how much wasted time do you have today? And how often do we waste time? Because part of redeeming the time is that we would be wise with the 24 allotments of hours we each get. No one here gets more than anybody else. Matt doesn't get 25, okay? And Martin doesn't get cheated and get 23. We all get 24 hours in a day. Some are really, really good at managing that time that they have, using that time wisely, investing it wisely. Some waste a lot of it, a lot of it. So at the end, at the end of it all, if you look back on your day and say, what did I do that was productive today? Especially for the kingdom, by the way. What did I do that was productive? How many hours did you stand in front of a glowing box? <laughs> I should say thin screen these days, right? A, something that's in front of you, and it could be that, it could be one of these, and it could be one of these. Something that lights your face up when you look at it. Some kind of a screen. Now, listen, every one of us probably has some kind of job that we got to do that requires internet or a computer or your phone. Or, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not saying anything against that. That's called productive time. You, if you don't work, you don't eat. I'm not talking about that time. I'm talking about the other time. And I'm not saying you can't, I'm not saying you can't play a game. I'm not saying you, you can't read the news. Or that's all legitimate stuff. That's all good stuff. But is it in balance? is the question. These are the things we have to ask ourselves because I believe there's so much out of balance in, 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 the, in, in people's lives and I think it's part of what God wanted to do this past year. If I can be honest with you, I think he wanted us to get some things in order. I think he wanted to see where your priorities lie. How many hours do you, just pick on one thing, watch TV in a week versus spending time reading or investing in your spiritual walk or investing in other people's spiritual walk. It's called discipleship. It's called leading. Or investing in prayer. Anything, right? How much time? TV compared to that. Internet surfing compared to that. Video gaming compared to that. The, the list goes on and on. It could be any kind of hobby or anything that's out there. What is taking up your time? And I've said before, whatever you devote the most time to is probably the thing that you're most passionate about. In other words, that may be the thing that does have dominion over you, as I said on Sunday. What are those things that have dominion over your life? I told you Sunday you need to be doing some inflection this week and looking into yourself and saying, what is it that has dominion in my heart? What do I devote my time to? It goes on and says here, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. Second time we're told this, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What does God want you to do with your time? You catching this now? It's not so much what can I do with my time. All things are permissible and all things are profitable. And this is something that I've been, in the last few years of my life here, been really looking at. All right, I can do this, but is it, it's permissible, it's okay, but is it profitable? And I'm finding that things that, I like to do that were permissible, that were not profitable, can become something profitable. Do you know that going, for instance, I, for years and years, I 
I just didn't golf anymore. I liked it when I was young in my 20s. I went and did a lot of, I would golf. I liked golfing, but I, I just, when you have a family, you got busy, all these kind of things, just, there ain't no time for that, right? But, but I've, uh, Scott, he's probably watching right now, um, he, he egged me on a few times, got me out in the golf cart, went out there, and I, and I did horribly. Um, but I enjoyed my time with him. I, I liked hanging out with him and some other friends, and I've gone out with some other guys and stuff. And now I see it as it's not so much about just going out and doing that and hitting a little white ball that makes you really angry. <laughs> or as Mark Twain said, uh, golf is just a good long walk spoiled by a little white ball. <laughs> true, true. Uh, it's not so much about that. It's about spending time. For me, it's about actually redeeming some time. It's about sharing time with other people, other brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's great to do those kind of things. You can sometimes do some of those things that you like to do, and if you're making it something that is a, an open door for ministry to try to reach some of the lost, I think it's great. I think it's a, a, a refocus of your time. Start looking at these things to redeem these, these times that God has for us. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Pause there before I read the rest of it. If we're going to be filled with the Spirit, the word here in the Greek means to make full or to fill up, uh, to cause to abound. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled up with the Spirit. Be abounding with the Spirit. To fill to the top so that nothing is lacking. You hearing that part? To fill it up to the top so there's no lack in your life whatsoever. Be filled with the spirit that leaves you with no lack. And to carry through to the end. Wow, wait a minute. If you put that in the context of the spirit, I'm going to be filled all the way up to the brim, to the top, so that I can abound and lack nothing and carry this thing out through to the end. Well, that makes a whole lot more sense all of a sudden. Because I have... The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues. Many, 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 many years ago. And so when he says be filled with the Spirit, he's not saying you need to be rebaptized with the Holy Spirit as if you don't have it. And I think that's where, I think Pastor Bruce alluded to this a week or two ago, about being filled to the top, I think, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Continually filled and topping off the tank. I like that version too. It's good. So it's not that you don't have the Holy Spirit. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. So then the Holy Spirit just like starts going away? No. So the Holy Spirit's like diminishing in your life? No, not in that sense, but there's an anointing that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives. And there's a constant refilling of this anointing that has to come. Even though I have the indwelling and the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit within me, there's an anointing that has to be there. That's what this oil is all about. I am not ever absent of the presence of the Holy Ghost in my life, and neither are you, amen? But there's an anointing. You get spent in this world, and you're supposed to spend the anointing. You're supposed to spend it on others, right? But you constantly need topped off. And I think it's one of the, I think it's one of the greatest crimes that Christians have done to our own selves, our own Christian walk, is we, we don't top off. Or we think, I've already got the Holy Ghost. I don't need to be filled again. There's a feeling that you need to constantly have. And it's not getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you already have. It's being topped off with this anointing, being filled up to be full. Top off the tank so that you can abound, be filled up and not lack, and carry through to the end. That's what that verse is saying. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another. Wait a minute. So if I'm filled up with the Spirit, then what should happen? We ought to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord and giving thanks. I'll come back to this on Sunday, this key point. But giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Along with this whole thing of being topped off, filled up, and pouring it all out on, on each other, is that we would be filled with the Spirit. And then there's something together in unity that happens here as well. The anointing isn't just for you. It's not to make you feel better. It's for you to spend on others, Right? Jesus didn't hog his anointing. Come on, imagine that, Jesus hogging his anointing. I can heal you, but I'm going to heal myself. 
It's not what he did, right? He looked for every opportunity to heal others, to help others. It was always about others, spending it on others, amen? In Acts chapter two, we see the same thing happen. The Holy Spirit says, same word there, plaroo, to fill the house. The Holy Spirit came in and filled the house where they were all at. There they are waiting for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to come. But two verses later, go ahead and turn to Acts two. Acts two, verse two. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven and a, a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Same word that was just used in Ephesians 5. Same word. But two verses later, it says in verse three, then there appeared to them divided tongues as fire and one uh, sat upon each of them and they were filled, different word, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, this Greek word pimplami means to fill or supply or to accomplish something. So they began to be filled with the Spirit, to be supplied with the Spirit, and to accomplish something. Same word used in Luke chapter 1, both times when Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was filled with the Spirit, began to prophesy, and the babe leapt within her womb. Same word there. And then her husband, Zacharias, after he's done being mute now, right? John is born, and He's, he's set free from that, and uh, he begins to prophesy. He was also filled with the Spirit. Now, we also know this. Elizabeth and Zacharias were not filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit at that point in time. They couldn't have been. They would have preceded Jesus, right? They would have preceded Pentecost. So that was not the same thing as getting the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have to understand that, but the Spirit certainly came upon throughout the entire Old Testament. The Spirit would come upon people right, would fill them, right, but never took residence in this because this was not yet the temple. Not until Jesus did this get to become the temple. External worship, much more religious practice, all these kind of things that had to take place, right? We, we make no bones about it. We are living in a new and a better covenant, amen? amen. And then Acts chapter three, there's even another word for, for being full, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, excuse me, uh, they were supposed to seek out men of God, uh, men who were full of the Holy Spirit. These were guys who were filled up. Funny, that word pleris means this, to, to be filled up or filling up of a hollow vessel. So that which was hollow becomes filled up. So in other words, you typically reach into the cabinet and you get an empty glass out, don't you? You find one that's empty to fill it up. And that's what God has done with every one of us. We which were empty, he's filled up. So they sought guys that were full of. Once were hollow beings, but now are full of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus had that same kind of filling when he was baptized by John the Baptist. The, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. It was a sign to John that this was the one. And then it says the Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness, but he came back from that wilderness experience. What? full of the Holy Spirit, full, same word used there, okay, from his return. Let me just say this about, and uh, if I can just, um, whoever wants to play some music, I don't care who's, come on up here, we're gonna, let's go into a little time of ministry here. Just kind of in closing, some thoughts about this. A lamp cannot keep burning, and I'm not talking about, uh, you know, again, we use a flashlight example, sooner or later those batteries are gonna go out, right? But let's, let's look at an oil lamp. And I know we don't typically use these uh, in, in today's day and age as much as, much as, as we're in times past. But a lamp cannot keep burning if there is not a steady stream of oil. A ha oil has to be added to it consistently. Or if you want to put it in other terms, uh, if you have a generator and the power goes out and you're running your generator, right? You can run it for hours on end, but you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to fill it with gasoline to power it, okay? When we had that tornado almost two years ago, uh, I was running my generator because our neighborhood got hit. And uh, we, I can't remember how long it was. Uh, it was almost a couple days though. But we were without power for quite a while because all those lines were knocked down. And uh, I had neighbors plugging in <laughs> to our generator. There's probably a sermon there. <laughs> but I remember I kept, I'd get up, and I'd, and even in the middle of the night, I'd wake up and be like, I wonder if that generator's running out, you know? And I'd go, because, you know, I didn't want my sump pit. That's the biggest thing for me, and the freezers to, 
uh, all fall out. So I had to constantly fill it back up, and I was always mindful of that. Even to the point that it woke me from my sleep. I didn't want to sleep too many straight hours because I didn't know exactly how many hours that thing would run, especially when other people next door and across, everybody's plugging in, right? Uh, pulling on that. So I had to constantly fill it up. You can understand the analogy. Same thing with the lamp. If there's not a steady stream of oil, if you're not always adding to it, what's going to happen? It's going to run dry and the flame will flicker out. It'll be extinguished and quenched. We must be mindful of that, especially now in this hour. More than any other time in human history that we cannot let the fire go out. We cannot let the Holy Spirit be quenched. We need the extra oil. It is necessary. But what good is all that oil if there's no spark? What good is all that oil if there's no flame? What good is my generator if I keep pull starting and it, and it won't go. I can fill it up all I want. I can fill it to overflowing and it's not going to get it to do anything. Because without a flame, you can't use up the oil. There has to be a flicker. There has to be something burning in your heart. Brothers and sisters, that flame must remain hot and it must remain supplied. It is the anointing that God wants for us to have. So I want to say this. We need to stay filled up. We need to keep topping off. We need to keep spending it on others. We need to keep ministering to him. Come on, let me say it again. We need to keep ministering to him. We're always asking him to minister to us. Most of our prayer life is us speaking at God. He's got a lot he wants to say. He's got a lot of things he wants to download to you. Can I suggest something? Shut your mouth a bit and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I say that kindly. Listen. Let's, let's close our mouths or pray in the Spirit. At least that, right? Again, the oil comes through a crushing and a pressing process. We've all been crushed and pressed quite a lot these past several months. Don't run from that process. Don't look for an easy way out. God wants to complete the work that he's begun in you. I pray that almost every day. God, that you would finish the work you've begun in me. You are the author and the finisher of my faith. I don't want you to start the story and not finish it well. Write my story, Lord. I mean, constantly asking God. That's my heart's desire. Humble yourself. Trust him. And as I say to all my athletes in any coach, uh, sport I've ever coached, you need to trust the process. I want to tell you that tonight. Trust the process. He knows what he's doing. But it's not working. It will. Can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It's not working. It'll work. Trust the process. The crushing process, it'll work. <laughs> but I don't like it. No. No. I didn't like it. My coach made me run, right? Run, run and to the point of, of puking or anything like that either, right? I didn't like some of the practices that we had. But I trusted that it was going to get me to the destination I needed to get to. When you're going through the crushing process, you can cry out to God, get me out of this. You can say, God, get me through this and have a happy heart in the process of it. Tonight, I feel like just to end this, that we just stand to our feet real quick. And I want us to just enter a time of just seeking God for a moment. Maybe you've been already... Um, doing some of this inflection we talked about Sunday morning and I'll continue to talk about this coming Sunday morning as well um, I'm only about halfway done with that but I felt like in the middle of those two sermons Sunday and Sunday that there was this time that God wanted to do something with the anointing and speak to us about his anointing and top us off of the anointing and maybe hey listen maybe somebody in here that does not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit you're born again you've given your heart to Christ he's your Lord and Savior, but you've never had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't, no one's going to make you. You're not a lesser person. You're just operating under an old covenant, so to speak. And I'm just telling you, the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to, not just to do the stuff, empowers us to be able to die to ourselves so we can surrender everything to Him. No clearer picture. Then when all the disciples swore to Jesus that night that he was arrested, that we're all willing to die with you. As we heard a week ago, even one, Peter, pulls out a sword and cuts off an ear to prove his point, right? 
What amazes me is, all these guys are arresting Jesus. There's an, an ear laying on the ground. He picks it up and he puts it back on the guy and heals him. And they all saw it. Think about that for a second. They all saw him pick an ear up off the ground and put it back on a guy. And they still arrested him and beat him and spat in his face and crucified him the next day. I'm just saying. Signs and wonders are not going to be enough for this generation. Show us a sign. The love of Jesus is what's going to actually win them over. Amen. Just bow your head, close your eyes for a moment. Father, I just want to open this time for anybody who would come up here this evening and, and just simply say, I have been spent. And I realize I've been spent for a while. And I just need topped off. Now, probably all of us here could, today could say, you know what? Today was tiring enough. I could be topped off after that. But I'm talking about if you've really felt spent for a season and you feel as though you've not been topped off and maybe, maybe you feel like you've just neglected to top off. I don't know. And maybe circumstances have just come against you to the point where you've been unable to for whatever reason. If that is you tonight, I just want you to come up front and some of the elders and deacons will just lay hands on you and we're just going to agree with you and pray for you and just ask for the anointing to come and fill you up. So I want everybody else just to focus on the, the power of the Holy Spirit right now. Just focus on His presence. If that's not you and you're feeling really good and you feel like you've been topped off, and you feel, that's great. That's great. Pray for these. And just enjoy the presence of God in these moments. As, as Dane's over here playing the piano, just get lost in His presence. Just, just get lost in His presence. I'm just going to ask some of the elders, and if we have too many more, come up here, some deacons, and, or those that feel like they want to minister, that's fine. Come on up here. And let's just start laying hands on them. Let's do an impartation right now. At any point in time, come on up. We're just going to pray, and then uh, we'll just do this for a little bit, and then we'll just release you here in a moment, okay?
sing this chorus tonight together. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are you. Sing it one more time. You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you God bless everyone.